Alcohol can be a tricky experience. Drink enough and it can make almost any event more fun and memorable. Drink too much and it does the opposite. You forget everything and the bits you do remember, you probably wish you didn't. But this doesn't apply only to bachelor parties and New Year's celebrations. In fact, we're going to take a look at 10 historical events where alcohol definitely played a crucial role in the outcome. Number 10. The Wedding of George IV It would be fair to say that when King George III of England announced the engagement of his son and heir George IV to Caroline of Brunswick in 1794, the junior George wasn't a fan of the arrangement. For starters, he was already technically married to Maria Fitzherbert, although their marriage was invalid under English law. Plus, he preferred a carefree life filled with wine, women, and gambling. But eventually, he wasn't left with much of a choice. George IV had racked up so many debts thanks to his excessive spending, and neither his father nor Parliament would bail him out unless he found a suitable Protestant wife and sired an heir. Enter Carolyn of Brunswick. She had the perfect pedigree, but not much else going for her. Allegedly, the first words George uttered when he laid eyes on his bride-to-be were, Harris, I am not well. Pray get me a glass of brandy. And that glass of brandy was followed by another, and then another, and well, you get the idea. George could hardly stand to be in her presence sober, and when it finally came time to tie the knot on April the 8th, 1795, the Prince Regent was so drunk that he had to be carried up the aisle. He slurred his way through the vows and even started crying at one point. The ceremony was followed by what we assume was an incredibly awkward reception, and then finally the wedding night where George failed to perform his royal duty because he was passed out. Number 9. The Eggnog Riot West Point has a long and varied history that goes goes back all the way to the birth of America. Situated in a strategic position on the Hudson River, it was a valuable military post during the Revolutionary War and gained infamy when Benedict Arnold tried to turn it over to the British. Then, in 1802, it became the first military academy in the country. In 1817, Colonel Sylvanus Thayer became the academy superintendent and developed the curriculum which is still partly used today. After a few years in charge, Thayer decided that discipline at West Point was on a downward slope, mainly due to drinking. Alcohol was already prohibited, but of course everybody still got drunk and the faculty generally looked the other way unless the offense was particularly egregious. But in 1826, Thayer put his foot down and said absolutely no alcohol, not even for that year's Christmas party. Unsurprisingly, the cadets ignored him and smuggled a few gallons of whiskey into campus a few days prior. Then on Christmas Eve, they got wasted on eggnog. The rowdiness started with some loud singing. Not too bad at first, but then things turned serious when two of the academy captains, Ethan Hitchcock and William Thornton, tried to end the party. Hitchcock literally read the riot act to a group of cadets, but instead of dispersing, they armed themselves with sticks rocks and swords looking for a fight. One of them even fired a shot at the captain when he tried to open the door. The captains called for their superiors when they realized that the nog had hit the fan and the drunken cadets took advantage of the opportunity by completely trashing the barracks in order to barricade the doors and windows. The following day, everyone was hung over, wondering what they'd done the night before. Ninety cadets had taken part in the riot, including one Jefferson Davis, future president of the Confederacy. Ultimately, though, only 19 were court-martialed, plus the soldier who allowed them to smuggle the booze onto campus. Eleven were expelled. Number eight, the Field of the Cloth of Gold. In June 1520, King Henry VIII of England and King Francis I of France held a two-week-long summit at Ballingham near Calais in order to strengthen the bond between the two nations. Both kings were keen to show off their wealth and opulence in front of the other one, which is why the event became known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold. There were huge feasts every day, the food was plentiful, the wine was unceasing, and the music was raucous. There was dancing, there was theatre, there was even a dragon kite made especially for the occasion that featured both royal symbols entwined with one another. And of course, there were lots of games to keep the people entertained. Jousting was the most popular spectacle, but wrestling was also a welcome sight, especially when the weather turned sour. Then one day, after a few glasses of wine, Henry did the unthinkable. He broke protocol and challenged King Francis to a wrestling match. Francis accepted the challenge and met Henry inside the squared circle for a little royal rumble. Both kings were young lions in their mid to late twenties, but on this occasion, Francis proved to be the cream of the crop, easily going over his English counterpart. Henry, however, was gracious in defeat and suggested an archery contest for a rematch where he emerged triumphant. Number 7. Andrew Jackson's Inauguration On March 4, 1829, Andrew Jackson was inaugurated as the seventh president of the United States. After the swearing-in ceremony in front of the Capitol building, Jackson invited the crowd of roughly 21,000 onlookers to join him at the White House for an open house reception. Unfortunately, most of the crowd took him up on the offer. It wasn't long before the White House was filled to the brim with rich and poor, upper and working class who wanted to congratulate the new president. The raucousness wasn't helped by the addition of alcohol, and before you knew it, the furniture was knocked over, dishes and glasses 
glasses were broken on the floor, and muddy footprints were everywhere. One attendee, Margaret Smith, described the scene as such. Ladies fainted, men were seen with bloody noses, and such a scene of confusion took place as it is impossible to describe. Those who got in could not get out by the door again, but had to scramble out the windows. President Jackson himself ultimately made his escape through a window and sought refuge at a nearby hotel. Eventually, Jackson's steward had the bright idea of installing large tubs filled with whiskey punch on the White House lawn, and that managed to lure out most of the crowd like moths to the flame, but the carpet smelled of cheese and booze for months afterwards. Number 6. The Signing of the Constitution in September 1787, 55 delegates from all of the American states except Rhode Island attended the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. The gathering culminated with the signing of the United States Constitution on September the 17th, although only 39 delegates agreed to sign the document. Everyone knew it was a landmark moment, so the delegates celebrated the best way they knew how by getting absolutely hammered. Two days before the signing, all 55 delegates gathered at a local tavern and partied like the British were getting ready to invade again. Curiously enough, the bill for that is historic evening was preserved, so here is what the framers of the Constitution drank between them. 54 bottles of Madeira wine, 60 bottles of claret, 8 bottles of whiskey, 42 assorted bottles of porter, beer, and hard cider, and 7 bowls of alcoholic punch. The cost for a party that went down in the history was £90, which is just over $20,000 today. This included a 2% breakage fee from the innkeeper, since it seemed that some of the delegates got a little too rowdy with his furniture. Number 5. Washington's Entry into Politics Staying with the Founding Fathers, we're going to focus on the foundingest of them all, George Washington, and how alcohol helped his entry into politics. By the time he was in his mid-twenties, Washington was already a distinguished military man thanks to his role in the French and Indian War, so a political position was the next natural step for him. In 1755, the 24-year-old Washington ran for a seat in Virginia's House of Burgesses, which was the colony's elected representative body. But the future father of the country lost his first campaign, garnering only 40 votes while his opponent secured 271. How so? His opponent got his voters wasted on beer, wine, whiskey, and rum punch. Even so, lessons were learned, so three years later, Washington ran again for the same office, and this time he didn't skimp out on the booze. His electoral office had 144 gallons of rum, beer, and hard cider ready and waiting for the thirsty voter willing to cast his vote for George Washington. The result, Washington won handily with 331 votes and launched his career in politics. Number 4. The October Revolution The October Revolution was one of the most crucial episodes in the modern history of Russia, which allowed the Bolsheviks led by Lenin to seize power and eventually form the Soviet Union. It all started on November 7, 1917, or October 25, going by the old calendar, in Petrograd, today known as St. Petersburg, when the Bolshevik Red Guards captured the Winter Palace. Of course, not everyone was on their side. The Bolsheviks had a civil war ahead of them and needed to prepare. There was just one problem, though. When they took over the Winter Palace, they also seized the largest private wine collection in the world. Lenin couldn't just deny access to the people. His whole shtick was that the riches of the aristocracy actually belonged to the laboring masses. So what followed was the granddaddy of all keggers, as the people of Petrograd got absolutely smashed on the Tsar's private stash. Predictably, this led to drunken mobs, lootings, and street violence, but Lenin hoped that they'd get it out of their system after a few days. They did not. As Bolshevik playwright Anatoly Lunacharsky put it, the whole of Petrograd is drunk. Nothing the Bolsheviks did could stop the thirsty masses. They erected walls around the cellar, but they were broken down. They placed guards, but they just started stealing the booze. They poured the wine into the streets, and the crowds drank it from the gutter. The city's jail cells were all filled with drunken looters. There was only one solution. Martial law was imposed, the Bolsheviks had to wait weeks until the booze finally ran out. Number 3. Lincoln's Assassination The assassination of Abraham Lincoln is already an infamous moment in history, so we're not going to dwell on it too much. We're just going to look at the role that alcohol played in the proceedings. First up is John Wilkes Booth, who initially went to the saloon near Ford's theater and had a couple of drinks to strengthen his resolve. His confederate, George Adzerat, who had been tasked with killing Vice President Andrew Johnson, did the same thing, except the alcohol had the opposite effect on him. Even though the Vice President was sitting all alone in his hotel room, Adzerat couldn't bring himself to do it, so he just spent the night drunkenly roaming the city. Last but not least, we have Officer John Frederick Parker, the Washington cop who had been assigned to protect the President. If he had been present, could he have stopped Booth from killing Lincoln and changed the course of history? Well, we'll never know, because during the intermission, Parker decided to leave the president and go to the Star Saloon next door and have a couple of drinks with Lincoln's footman and carriage driver. Number 2. The Burning of Persepolis 
During the mid-4th century BC, Alexander the Great invaded the Achaemenid Empire and in 330 he captured the Persian city of Persepolis. When he entered the city, Persepolis was one of the greatest metropolises that the ancient world had ever known. When he left, it was nothing but smoldering ruins. The burning of Persepolis was one of Alexander's most infamous acts, but the question remains, did he do it on a drunken dare? Almost all the ancient historians agreed that Alexander and his men were drunk when they burned the place down. They had celebrated their victory by looting, feasting, and of course, drinking the night away. But historian Dar Adora Sicilus points the finger at a woman named Thais, an Athenian who got too close to the drunken Alexander and kept prodding him throughout the festivities, telling him what an achievement it would be for him to destroy the pride of the Persians. This was the ancient equivalent of a double dog dare, so obviously Alexander was left with no choice. Only one Roman historian named Arian claimed that Alexander was sober when he burned Persepolis, and he did it simply as revenge for what the Persians did to Athens during the Greco-Persian Wars a hundred years earlier. Number 1. The Rise of Agriculture is beer responsible for civilization as we know it? According to some archaeologists, the answer is maybe. We can all agree that the agricultural revolution was a key element in the development of the earliest human societies. Instead of going out to hunt and gather, people decided to grow stuff and then make other stuff with it. The places where agriculture thrived soon evolved into the first villages and boom another ancient civilization is born. Tradition tells us that early humans domesticated grain for bread, but maybe they used it for beer first. This is known as the beer before bread hypothesis, and as you can tell from the name, it's not a proven theory yet, it's just an idea. It has been around for over 60 years and is gaining more and more acceptance, though. The intoxicating effect of alcohol would have given it an important ceremonial role. At the moment, the Natafian culture from the Levant holds the record for the oldest man-made alcohol thanks to some 13,000-year-old stone mortars that were used to brew beer, and they too were Believed to drink the booze during ritual feasts to venerate the dead. This could suggest why ancient cultures like the Natufians would prize beer.